Hello everyone and welcome to the second video about making this year's pumpkin project. A few days ago I showed the process of constructing a giant taffeta skirt for this costume. And to complete the ensemble I must also make a coordinating blouse, which is what this video will be about. And it will probably be a long one. Though this is just a blouse, it is a pretty complicated one and a lot of time was invested in constructing it and embellishing it. So let's just get started. Step one was cutting out the base layer for the body of the blouse and the yoke. All these pieces were cut from black cotton gauze, which is a very lightweight cotton fabric. It's not my favorite to work with, but I ordered all the materials for this online and my options were a little bit limited. It's also just being used as the base layer and won't even be visible on the finished garment. The body of the blouse will be covered with gathered layers of organza and netting cut from a completely different pattern. The cotton base layer fits close to the body, where the organza and netting will flow away from it. The yoke will also be covered with organza and netting, but it will sit flat against the cotton and also form closely to the body. You can see me laying the organza and netting layers over the cotton yoke pieces in this footage. I didn't bother pre-cutting them to the exact size, instead I trimmed the overlay to the size of the cotton pieces later on. After the overlay was pinned in place, I basted it in place by hand using large running stitches and pre-waxed thread. Like I mentioned in the skirt video, wax thread is less likely to catch or knot up, which makes basting way less frustrating. This was repeated for all three yoke pieces. Then the overhanging bits of overlay were trimmed off. I used pinking shears for this to prevent fraying on the interior of the bodice, but I ended up fully lining it, so this was unnecessary. At this point, I was reminded of why I don't like cotton gauze. Its major flaw is that it doesn't hold its shape well, and the yoke has to support the body of the bodice, the front closures, and a large ruffle, and I wasn't confident it would do that without warping. So I backed the pieces with the lightweight cotton inner lining. This fabric isn't heavy, but it's finely woven in such a way that makes it sturdy. So sturdy, in fact, you can use it to back fabrics when corset making, so I trusted it a lot more than the gauze. That was basted to the backs of all the yoke pieces too, then the excess was cut off. I pinned the yoke pieces together at the shoulders with the right sides facing each other. Now this is kind of embarrassing, but I drafted this pattern like two weeks before making the garment, and the post mock-up alterations to said pattern made the markings for the seam allowance a bit confusing. I wasn't sure whether I had allowed for three quarter inch seams or half inch seams, so I compromised and sewed them as five eighths of an inch seams. Not the most professional move, but the bodice ended up fitting, so who cares? Those seams are pressed open, then I began cutting out the previously mentioned very large ruffle. This ruffle is purely decorative, and I wanted it to look as light and fluffy as possible, so it is cut from one layer of organza and one layer of mesh without an opaque backing. Due to the width of the mesh fabric, which was only 38 inches wide, I had to cut the ruffle in four pieces. There will be a seam at the center back and shoulders, but on the bright side, the seams made it way easier to line up when sewing it to the yoke later on. The seams were all pinned with the right sides facing each other, and sewn with a one inch allowance. The organza and netting layers were seamed together separately, and the large allowance is because I had originally planned on seaming together the netting and organza at the same time using French seams. Since the fabric is sheer, and I didn't end up needing the seam allowance, the seam allowance was really obvious, so I trimmed it down to a quarter inch or so, then thoroughly pressed the seams. Then I lined the seams on the organza and netting layers up with the bottom edges even and the right sides facing each other. The organza and netting were sewn together along the bottom edge with about a third of an inch seam allowance. I'd originally allotted a half inch hem allowance at this edge, but liked the idea of a longer ruffle, so when I switched methods for finishing this edge, I decided to take advantage of that option. And I switched to this method instead of the originally planned quarter inch rolled hem because a rolled hem is a bit bulkier. That bulk in the hem makes that edge stiffer and can cause ruffles to be less roughly since the edge naturally stays flatter. This method leaves the hem softer so it is more likely to follow the gathering at the top edge of the ruffle, creating a nicer ruffle. To reduce the bulk in the hem even further, I clipped the seam allowance to about an eighth of an inch. Then I ironed the seam flat and ironed it again so the right sides were facing outward and the raw edges from the seams were sandwiched between the layers. The bottom edge wasn't as even as I wanted it to be and it was kind of boring compared to the details I had planned for the yoke, so I jazzed it up with some narrow lace scalloped edging. This trim looks innocent, but it was quite troublesome. It is edging, so it has a straight edge intended to be sewn onto the edge of something, but that edge was quite frayed, so even after stitching it on, if the trim was pulled on, it separated from the fabric. After some trial and error, I found it was easiest to secure from the back side of the ruffle by sewing further into the trim than what was probably intended. After the trim passed the tug test, I moved on to gathering the top edge. And I did this by machine, 
Sort of, but not with a gathering or ruffler foot like you might think. Instead, I sewed across the top edge with a large stitch length and low tension. I only backstitched at one end. At the other, I left the thread tails long and loose. I sewed two lines of stitching this way, one a third of an inch away from the top edge of the fabric and another a quarter inch below that. Then by hand, I separated the thread tails and grasped onto the top thread extending from the top side of the fabric. I pulled gently on both top threads at the same time, causing the fabric to pucker to the point of gathering. Then I pushed the gathers down the fabric, or thread, depending on how you look at it, and pulled some more. This process was repeated many times until the fabric was gathered to a third of its original length. The key to this method is being really gentle. If you tug too hard, you can break the threads and it will all unravel, which really, really sucks. It also only works with thin fabrics like organza, netting, chiffon, silk charmeuse, or a single layer of quilting cotton. Anything else puts too much tension on the thread and snaps it right away, or at least that has been my experience. Once it is gathered to the right length, the end of the top thread can be tied to the end of the bottom thread and the excess can be clipped away. I arranged the gathers so they were even, then began pinning the ruffle to the yoke with the right sides facing each other and the edges even. I lined the seams in the ruffle with the center back, center front, and shoulders of the yoke, then eased the volume between these points. I machine basted the ruffle onto the yoke, a little less than a half inch away from the edge. Then while the pins were still in place, I hand basted the ruffle on as well, except this time I'm stitching over an inch away from the edge. The reason I'm doing this is to prevent the ruffle from flipping down and getting caught in the seam attaching the yoke to the bodice. Ruffles are beautiful, but they are also unwieldy and can interfere with construction unless properly tamed. And I'm not saying that I should star in a really lame sequel to Tiger King called Ruffle Queen solely about my exploits over the last eight years taming ruffles, but I'm not saying that I shouldn't either. Now the yoke was done, sort of, at least for now, and I could move on to the body of the blouse. I cut the pieces for this out earlier, but it wasn't until this point that I actually removed them from tissue and started sewing them together. Though there wasn't actually much sewing involved. All I really did was sew darts into the front, then iron those darts. After the darts were done, I moved on to constructing the more complicated bodice overlay. This is cut for a different, wider pattern, which will be gathered to match the outer dimensions of the cotton base pieces. Like the other elements I've worked on so far, this overlay is cut from organza and mesh using pinking shears since I didn't really know what I was doing. Before removing the pieces from the pattern, I went through with tiny scissors and notched the pieces at the points where the gathering would begin and end. Then I pinned the corresponding layers of mesh and organza together so the edges were even and the right sides were facing outward. The mesh and organza layers of each piece were basted together by hand. I did this by hand just to prevent warping or puckering since this fabric is quite thin and prone to both of those things. Then I sewed two loose lines of stitching using a low tension and large stitch length between all the points that required gathering. I left the thread tails on one side long and used the same method detailed for the ruffle to gather the pieces down to the correct widths. The now gathered organza mesh overlay could be pinned to the cotton base layer. I lined the center back and center front points first, then pinned outward from those points until all the edges lined up. This time I machine basted the layers together. Since I was also sewing through the gauze this time, I was less worried about warping. I think I was also feeling a bit lazy, but there is no proving that. With the overlay and base layers attached, I could move on to sewing the various pieces together, starting by sewing up the shoulder seams, once again with a 5 eighths of an inch allowance. The shoulder seam was ironed open, then aligned with the shoulder seams on the yoke. I matched up at the center point and back points as well, then pinned the layers together with the right sides facing each other. This seam was sewn with a half inch allowance and pressed downward. After it was done, my bodice had started to look like a bodice. I put it on the dress form and got a really good idea of what it might look like finished, and I hated it. Because the base layer of the bodice was black, all the details and texture that the organza and netting and lace trim provided completely disappeared. It looked like a puffy black blob, not a gorgeous turn of the century bodice. As all professionals do, I sulked about it for several days, then attempted to fix it by ripping it apart. That part hurt a little. I removed the body of the bodice from the yoke, which was the only part I planned on salvaging. Well, the yoke and my beautiful ruffle, which I'd obviously grown quite attached to by this point. The body, however, was completely scrapped, and I recut the base layer from bright orange taffeta. This is the fabric I used for the skirt, and I did not plan on needing it for anything else, so I did not have very much left. The back pieces ended up having a seam down the back, and the front piece is a bit narrower than it should be. I also completely ignored the grain line, 
I think everything was cut on the bias because that was the direction of what little fabric I had left. Stars were sewn into the body, the overlay was recut, and the overlay layers were basted together. The only difference is that this time the overlay was gathered down by hand. I did this because doing it by machine requires backstitching at one edge. Those stitches were hidden in the final garment since the base layer was also dark, but they would have been more visible against the orange. I also generally prefer gathering by hand for tiny distances. I feel like it gives me more control. But after the gathers were sewn, the overlay was machine basted to the taffeta. The shoulder seams were sewn, ironed, and seamed to the yoke, and I was much happier with how it looked at this time. But it was still a little dark and bland. I decided to jazz it up with some contrasting orange details, starting with a partial placket. The placket follows the curvature of the front edge of the bodice and is three quarters of an inch wide. It ends in a point just below the yoke. I cut the base for it from fan roll, a heavy, almost buckram-like fusible interfacing. Then I fused that base, which didn't include seam allowances, onto a piece of taffeta that was slightly larger than it. The edges of the taffeta were trimmed to sit a quarter inch away from the interfacing, then turned inward using an iron, so they tightly hugged the edges of the interfacing and looked nice and crisp. I liked how it looked, but it was a bit too harsh against the dark yolk, so I decided to outline it with more of that scalloped lace edging. This was basted on by hand using whip stitches. Then it was pressed again to ensure it maintained optimal sharpness. Here you can see the sort of finished placket prior to sewing it onto the bodice, which was the next step. I positioned the center of the placket on the center point of the right front panel of the blouse, then pinned from just below the yoke towards the neckline. I made the placket a bit longer than it needed to be, just in case, so any excess extending past the neckline can easily be trimmed away. The placket was stitched on by machine as close to the edges of the taffeta as I could get, and after it was sewn on, all the basting stitches securing the lace trim to it could be removed. I clipped into the bodice at an angle, from the front edge to the point of the placket. The bottom portion of the bodice was turned inward at this point, by about an inch and a quarter. The rest of the front edge of the right bodice piece was turned inward along the stitching securing the placket, so there is no visible fabric beyond the edge of the placket. The left side front edge was turned inward by an even half inch and pinned down. Both sides were sewn down using whip stitches, and I did that late at night when the lighting was really bad so I didn't film it, but you aren't missing out on much. That same night I did a lot of beading. The bottom of the bodice had a good amount of texture visible with the contrasting lining, but the yoke still looked pretty flat. So every dot in the dotted mesh was embellished with a 6mm black sequin and a bright orange seed bead. The thread was knotted before sewing on each sequin. This way if a sequin catches on something, it won't pull and cause the fabric to gather. It is tedious, but it leads to a much nicer end result. And this process is already pretty tedious, so what does a bit more effort matter? I beaded every single dot on the yoke, except for the ones at the very front of the left edge, since those will be covered with a lapped blouse closure, and the ones within a half inch of the neckline, since they would just get in the way of seaming the collar on. And when doing this, I'm actually only sewing through the seed beads in this process. The seed beads are larger than the hole in the sequins, so stitching through them alone holds the sequin on. But the beading didn't end there. I decided to jazz up the bottom edge of the yoke too, I did this with alternating 3mm and 5mm glass beads. I sewed these on using something similar to a backstitch. Three beads are sewn on, then I bring the needle back up through the fabric and go through the final bead again before threading on any additional ones. Two more beads are threaded on the needle, then stitched down, then the needle is brought back up through the final bead and the process is repeated again and again until the beads border the entirety of the yoke. I love the bit of sparkle and interest this added, but it still wasn't quite enough, so I pulled the seed beads back out. These were sewn on in lengths of 2 to 10, extending straight out from the beading around the yoke and onto the ruffle. I staggered the lengths of beads to create a dense, randomish looking pattern. I was originally alternating rows of 2 and 4 beads, but I thought that wasn't really dramatic enough. I think the random pattern ranging from 2 to 10 is a lot more interesting. This beading design was also carried around the entire perimeter of the yoke. And it also took a very long time. And again, I really liked how this looked, but it was still missing something. I ended up sewing orange seed beads to either side of the top edge of the 3mm black beads. This helped carry some of the orange upward onto the yoke and made everything look more cohesive. But the beading still did not end there. Oh no, I decided to carry it onto the lace trim surrounding the placket, and this time I used a new beading combo, one 3mm black bead bracketed by orange seed beads. I didn't do anything fancy here to make them more secure, I just sewed them on three at a time at the center of each scallop. Now the placket was pretty much done, except for buttons and closures, and in this case those are two separate things, it will have decorative buttons on the top and snap closures down the front. The snap closures were placed an inch or so apart and extend down both front edges of the yoke, 
The waist of the bodice closes with two hooks and bars, since there will be more tension on the garment at that point. The bodice was coming along well at this point, but it was lacking sleeves and a collar, and the collar was less intimidating, so I made that first. The collar will consist of four layers, cotton gauze lining, cotton inner lining to help the gauze keep its shape, hair canvas to provide shape to the collar in general, and finally, bright orange silk taffeta to match the plackets. Here I'm cutting out the cotton and lining layers. Then I'm tracing around that same pattern onto hair canvas. After the pattern is removed, I'm using a ruler to mark lines half an inch away from the original outline. These are the lines I'm actually going to cut across. After the hair canvas is cut out, I'm marking a line half an inch away from the top and side edges of the collar lining. The hair canvas is aligned with these markings and pinned in place. Basically, this whole process is just removing the seam allowance from the hair canvas, then marking the seam allowance on the lining as a guide for where not to put the hair canvas. The edges of the hair canvas were secured to the collar lining using cross stitches. The rest of the hair canvas was pad stitched to the lining fabric using a pad stitch. Well, sort of. I kind of forgot the pattern and rhythm of pad stitching, so it's kind of a bastardized version of it, at least on the half I filmed. I did a much better job on the other side, but that is the story of everything I film. Or I don't film, rather. This finished off the lining, and I used the original pattern to cut out the outer layer of silk, but I had to add seam allowance and a seam to the center back edge due to a severe shortage of silk taffeta. The edges of the silk layer and lining were lined, then pinned together with the right sides facing each other. And I pinned the layers from the side with the hair canvas attached, so when sewing them together, I could follow the edges of the hair canvas, which you can see me doing here. After the front and bottom edges of the collar were stitched together, I clipped excess bulk from the corners and trimmed all the seam allowance to a quarter inch. I ironed the seam allowance from the lining inward so it's folded over the edges of the hair canvas. Then I turned the collar so the right sides of the fabric are facing outward. I used a point turner to get the points nice and sharp, then pressed the collar from the taffeta side until the edges were lined and nice and crisp. Here is the collar right after being pressed, but it was not yet finished. Much like the rest of the bodice, I decided it needed more flair. However, I did not film that process this time, mainly because you've seen it earlier in the video. Like with the placket, the edges were trimmed with scalloped lace edging that was whip stitched in place by hand. Then the lace trim was embellished with the 3mm black bead and seed bead pattern that was used earlier around the edges of the placket. And after this was done, I found it adequate. The ends of the collar were positioned a half inch away from the center front on both sides of the front panels, and the seam at the center back was aligned with the center back point. Then the collar fabric was eased between these points to sit flush against the bodice. I basted the collar in place by hand using large running stitches, and after this was done, the pins could be removed, and I used my iron and its steam to press out any wrinkles caused from easing the material. Then I pulled my bodice pattern out once again. This is the base bodice pattern for the fitted layer and yoke. I cut this from more cotton gauze and seamed it together using the same methods you saw earlier in this video, just without any of the frills attached. Literally, it was sewn without any ruffles this time, because it will simply serve as the lining. Here you can see it in all its boring, non-ruffly glory. I lined the neckline of the lining up with the neckline of the bodice, and pinned them together with the right sides facing each other. Any excess lining fabric at the front edge was folded outward and pinned down as well. By machine, I sewed across the neckline using a half-inch seam allowance. The seam was notched quite dramatically to help it turn outward smoothly. After notching, the seam was pressed so the seam allowance sat under the lining layer. Then I stitched as close to the seam line as I could on the lining side and through all the seam allowance. This process is called understitching and also helps edges turn inward smoothly. You'll see it done a lot on facings and such. Now the lining could be turned inward at this edge and pinned to sit properly around the neckline. I also pinned the lining in place around the armholes, side edges, and waistline, and this was done by simply aligning the edges. The front edges were a bit trickier, but not by much. For these, the lining was folded inward, so the fold sat just inside the outer edge and the raw edges were hidden. The lining was basted in place across the armholes, waistline, and side edges using large running stitches. The folded edges at the front were whip stitched down by hand with a great deal more care. Earlier on, I said I was sewing on all the closures, but I actually avoided sewing in the closures near the top edge, since I thought they might interfere with the collar or make the lining harder to attach. Now that both of those were installed, I could go ahead and sew on the final snap and hook bar closure at the top of the collar and placket. And now I could finally move on to something more fun, 
decorative closures. And these come in the form of Swarovski crystal jet skull buttons. When I bought these, they weren't actually buttons yet, they were just flat backed crystals. So I bought metal button backs, which have one flat side and one side with a metal shank. I used E6000 to glue these onto the backs of the skulls. I was quite careful about the placement of the button backings. I made sure they were all placed vertically, making them easier to sew on in the same orientation, which is important when buttons aren't circular. I sewed buttons onto each point of the collar, just for fun, and set aside eight for the cuffs of the sleeves. The rest were stitched to the placket, placed a little over an inch apart. Since these are decorative, I wasn't overly thorough when sewing them on, but I still used two strands of thread and tied off between each one. After all the skulls were sewn on, my placket was well and truly finished, and the sleeves could unfortunately no longer be procrastinated away. The sleeves are made from a self-drafted pattern that I spent an entire day, eight mock-ups, and six yards of fabric on. They have a slightly more fitted base layer or lining, which was cut from more taffeta scraps, so the coloring would be consistent with the bodice. At this point, I only had enough fabric left to cut out the top piece of the sleeves, but that was the only piece I needed for the next few steps, so I decided that was a later me problem. The overlay is made from a much larger pattern that is 36 inches wide at its largest point. It's massive, and the overlay was cut once again from mesh and organza. Much like with the bodice overlay, I notched the fabrics at the points where it needed to be gathered. Then I basted the layers of organza and mesh together. My use of organza as an overlay in this project was mainly because I wanted to use it in the sleeves, but I wanted the opacity of the overlay to be consistent across all the bodice pieces. The organza is very sheer and lightweight, it has a lot of body and a lot of volume, and I wanted my sleeves to have a lot of volume, so it was an easy fabric choice to make. The organza does provide volume, it didn't provide quite enough for what I had in mind. My mock-ups were all stuffed with tissue paper to create the desired shape, but I went for a more elegant solution for the final thing. The top half of the oversleeve pattern was cut from a stiff petticoat net. Then the top and side edges were gathered to match the dimensions of the taffeta sleeve base slash visible lining. I also drafted and cut out a tapered strip which will serve as a base for a ruffle, and be a ruffle in and of itself. The ruffles that will mount to it are made from 90 inch long strips of netting. The top edges of those strips were gathered down by machine to match the width of the bottom of the tapered strip, which they were then sewn onto. Then the top edge of the tapered strip was gathered down as well, and my sleeve understructure was done. The ruffle is pinned between the points where the sleeve will be gathered, about 3 inches away from each side edge. After it was pinned into position, I machine basted it on. Then I began arranging the netting layer cut from the overlay pattern. It was gathered down to match the dimensions of the sleeve base, so I simply had to match up the edges and pin it in place. Then it was machine basted on as well. Then, from the back side of the fabric, I'm hand basting the netting down, so it'll be a little less rambunctious and troublesome when trying to attach the mesh and organza overlay, which is the very exciting next step. The taffeta and netting layers have pretty much the same dimensions, up until just above the elbow, where the overlay flares out dramatically. But I'm starting by attaching them together at the points where they do line up, first with pins, then with basting stitches. I began gathering the side edges of the overlay first, between the notches I made earlier. I gathered them with two parallel rows of running stitches. After sewing them, the ends were pulled taut until the material was gathered to the right length. Then the ends were tied together and buried on the wrong side of the fabric. Once the side edges were gathered, the overlay edges aligned with the length of the taffeta layer edges, so they could be pinned together. Then I matched the center of the overlay with the center of the lining and started gathering the fabric outward from that point, gathering the front and back sections separately using the same method I used for the side edges. It just took a bit longer since there was more gathering to be done at this edge. Like, a lot more. But I got there in the end, and once the gathering was done and the thread was tied off, the gathers were arranged until I felt they looked even, and pinned to the base layer. Now the gathered edges of the overlay were machine basted to the base layer to keep them in place. I marked a horizontal line between the notches indicating where the gathering on the sides of the sleeve begins. This is where it really poofs out and everything below that is pretty fitted. I pinned the taffeta and overlay together along this line, then used cross stitches to permanently tack them together. In hindsight, this would have been way easier to do prior to gathering the overlay, but sometimes you sew and you learn. I mostly did this from the back of the fabric, but I did have to do a bit of easing from the front. Some volume from the overlay had to be eased to the center to make it look nicer. 
From the right side of the sleeve, I marked the center point of the previously made line. I positioned a beaded bow applique at this point. These appliques have fusible web on the back, but don't adhere properly due to how thick they are. So after doing my best to fuse it on, I went ahead and reinforced its position by whip stitching it in place by hand. If you saw my video about the skirt to go with this project, then this whole process will look familiar. It's just on a sleeve this time. The beading around the applique is very similar to the black beads used around the yoke, but it is lacking a burst of orange that I used near the neckline. So to make it more cohesive, I sewed rows of orange seed beads extending from the top of the bow. I also sewed on one of my homemade tassels using coordinating beads just below the bow. And now I really needed to cut out the undersleeve piece. I hadn't magically acquired more fabric, so I borrowed some from the skirt. It will have a smaller train than originally planned, but it means the bodice will have sleeves, so I think it was a good sacrifice to make. The undersleeve doesn't feature any gathering, so the overlay can be cut from the same pattern. The organza and mesh were laid atop the silk with all the right sides facing up. Then they are pinned and basted together. The bottoms of the sleeves are so fitted that they won't fit over my hands, which is common with my projects. Usually it isn't intentional, it's just a frustrating accident I notice hours before trying to photograph something. But this time it was intentional. I wanted the sleeves to be really fitted, and to accomplish that I planned for a 4 inch long slash at the wrist between the over and under sleeve pattern pieces. This point will close with more skull buttons and hand sewn loops. The first step for creating those loops is making the thread base for them. The thread base is made by sewing between points I marked, knotting the thread between each point, and leaving the thread a bit loose between them to create a loop. And these loops are placed a half inch away from the edge of the fabric. From the right side of my fabric, the thread loop bases are visible, and to bulk them out, I'm stitching around each thread base using something similar to a buttonhole stitch. You bring the needle under the thread base, creating a loop in the thread you're sewing with. Then bring the needle through that loop and pull taut around the thread base. This is repeated again and again, working your way across the base loop until it's completely wrapped with additional thread knots. I'm honestly not very good at this, so you might not want to treat this as a tutorial. Mine definitely ended up with a few lumps and bumps in them. But the loops are still fully functional, and none of my projects are ever perfect anyway. I'd much rather use the right technique and do it poorly than not bother trying the right technique at all. Sadly, practicing is the only way to improve at things. But on the bright side, practice means you always can improve at things. So I repeated this process until I had four loops sewn on each undersleeve piece. The undersleeve was pinned to the main sleeve piece with the edges aligned. I sewed from just above the opening point to the top of the sleeve using a half inch allowance. The seam was pressed open and the portion left open had the edges turned and pressed inward by a half inch. It was thoroughly ironed from the exterior as well. Then there was more cuff stuff to be done. Step one was just stitching around the opening by hand using small running stitches. Then I pinned a triangular piece of silk taffeta that will function as a gore, godet, or vent. I'm not really sure what the correct terminology would be, but it will prevent any skin from being visible beneath the closure. I lined its edges with the edges that were turned inward, and sewed it in place with cross stitches. Now the interior was looking a little rough, so much like with the bodice, I decided the sleeves would be fully lined. Except this time I'm using a plain cotton instead of the black gauze. It's easier to work with, and you won't see it, so why not? The lining pattern was cut from the smaller base sleeve pattern. I sewed up the inner seam at first, leaving the bottom few inches open to allow for the slash at the wrist. When pressing the seam, I also pressed the edges of the opening inward by a half inch. I matched the bottom edges of the lining up with the bottom edges of the sleeves, and pinned them together. I also pinned the folded edges so they covered the raw edges around the vent. Speaking of the edges around the vent, or whatever you want to call it, those were sewn down by hand using slip stitches. Then I went through and sewed on the remaining skull buttons, so they sat parallel to their corresponding loops. Then the rest of the lining edges were basted to the rest of the sleeve with large running stitches. Now the final sleeve seam could be pinned and sewn. I used a half inch seam allowance again, but after fitting, they were slightly too big. So I sewed another line of stitching a quarter inch inward from it. The fit was much nicer, so I felt comfortable trimming off the excess allowance using pinking shears. The pink edge and the double row of stitching should prevent fraying from becoming an issue. I pressed the seam allowance to the side, then turned the bottom edge of the sleeve inward by half inch and pressed it in place. I top stitched flat binding across this edge, 
After the binding was on, I folded the hem inward once again, which it naturally wanted to do at the point where it had been ironed, and I sewed the top edge of the binding to the lining using whip stitches. This secured the hem without any stitches being visible from the exterior. And at this point, the end was near. I sewed up the side seams with a considerably smaller allowance than I had originally planned. The taffeta is much stiffer than the cotton I used for my mock-up and the gauze I planned on using for the final garment. There are also a lot more layers of fabric leading to less ease, so it fits smaller than my mock-up just in general. And the placket required turning the front edge inward by a bit more than I expected. So my three quarter inch side seams became one third of an inch side seams, but that's what wider seam allowances are for. And lastly, the sleeves were sewn on. I had to gather the head slightly to get them to fit, which I was expecting, and I was very careful when pinning them on to make sure their volume was pinned out of the way and wouldn't get caught in the seam. I did that off camera because setting sleeves is one of my least favorite things and filming only makes it worse. But here you can see me sewing them on with a 5 8 of an inch allowance. I removed the pins after and did a fit check along with giving it a once over to make sure it was sewn on properly. Then I sewed another line of stitching a quarter inch away from the first to prevent the edge from fraying. After another fit check and placing the bodice on my dress form and triple checking, I deemed the sleeves symmetrical and decently set. After that, I felt comfortable trimming the excess seam allowance just past the second line of stitching. And this finished off my blouse. I am really, really happy with this as a garment. I love all of the details and I worked really, really hard on certain aspects of the pattern, especially the sleeves. And I think that shows in how nicely proportioned they are and how nicely they ended up fitting. I had a good idea of what I wanted this blouse to look like going in but this was definitely the first project I've made in a while where it kind of evolved as I worked on it and I felt like I was constantly improving it by continuing to embellish it and layer various fabrics. It was just a really satisfying fun project that was frustrating sometimes not quite knowing what direction I was going to go in. I ended up enjoying the process as a whole and I enjoyed the garment I ended up with too. I hope you guys like how it turned out as well and that you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see worn photos of the finished costume, I will have those up on my blog and my Instagram, which will both be linked in the description box down below. Before I go, I do just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who make projects like this one and videos like this one possible. There will be a whole bunch of their names on screen, but I want to give an extra special shout out to my top tier patrons who are Cass, Tracy Smith, Alex Perez, Courtney F, Sharon Wigham, Mo Quintana, Sharon Cyrus, Emma Hargrave, and Jordan Carpenter. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much to everyone for their support. As I mentioned in my last video, I'm a bit behind on credits, so these are the credits for July, but I'm going to be back on track, and if you've been part of a $10 and up tier, then you will have your name in the credits of a video. I promise I'm just a bit behind. But thank you so much for sticking with me. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it, and I really do hope you enjoyed. If you'd like to see more videos like this, then you can subscribe, uh, and if you want to give this video a like and a comment, then that would really help me out. And that is it for this video, but I will talk to all of you very soon.